Um, this evening, I'm going to talk about uh, an underappreciated problem, uh, which is that as we go through a and our lives and age, the infections we get and what those infections do to us change really quite radically. Um, and I'm going to take this opportunity, as this is also the last lecture in this series on infection, uh, to draw together several of the strands that I've actually talked about as we go through the year, as I've gone through the body systems. So through uh, nerves, through the brain, uh, through the, uh, the respiratory system, through the abdominal system. Uh, but today, uh, I'm going to talk about infections and age. Now, the inf an infection you get, an infection your family will get, fr your friends will get, will have very different uh, implications depending on where you are in your uh, life course. And that's for several different reasons. The probability of getting an infection and which infection you get will vary as you go through life. Some of that's behavioural, you do different things. Some of that's environmental and some of that's biological. And I'm going to give examples of all of those. In general, if we were to make a sweeping generalisation, infections are very dangerous to the very young and the very old and not very dangerous to people in, in between those ages. But there are some exceptions which I'm going to come on to. And certainly the same infection may be relatively trivial at one age and really quite serious at others, and that isn't always predictable. Or at least it may present very differently, be a completely different disease. And then I'm going to talk in very broad terms about where infections in the world are going. And in broad terms, what is going to happen is infections, which have been historically the biggest driver of mortality, are going down at the moment because of reductions in infections in children, but will go up in the, uh, within our lifetimes because of the ageing of the global population. So this is, this is something which is going to go in two different directions. Let's just make the obvious point. Severe infections are definitely commoner in the old and in the young. And these are data from a high income setting, specifically they're data from the UK. They're just a few years out of date, but I just thought this was a nice way of illustrating it. On the left here, we have hospital administrations here, admissions here in the UK by, infec by infection, so these are just infectious admissions, and by age, where the bottom bar is zero to four years, and around here is when people turn 65. And what you can see is large numbers of admissions in the first year of life and uh, significant numbers of admissions towards the upper years of life, but very few in between, some, all the way through. But if we look at mortality, how many people die of infections, in a high income setting, all those child deaths pretty well have gone. They're still getting infected, but children are not dying. But the deaths in adults, in particularly older adults, uh, those are continuing. So I'm going to go through very much uh, in the very classical um, uh, Shakespearean uh, seven ages of man. I'm going to give up at a certain point because it, start, it ceases to work, but it certainly works uh, for the first uh, few stages. First, the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Now, birth is an incredibly dangerous process. It's, your most, it's the most dangerous period of your life. Uh, almost certainly, uh, at any particular point, um, and infections definitely contribute to those, uh, those deaths. So let's start on your birthday. And two sets of risks are happening when, you have you, when you're born. The first of which is as you come out through the birth canal, anything that's sitting there gets onto you as a first uh, day one baby, uh, and you can get infected from that. And there are particular infections uh, which are important, of which the most important I'm going to talk about is something called Group, group B Streptococcus. But uh, there are some old friends, E. coli, I talked a lot about that in my talk about the abdominal system. And the other risk is that as you come out, uh, your blood, which has been kept very separate between you and uh, your baby, um, uh, can mix as the process happens. And at that point, some bloodborne viruses like HIV and hepatitis can be transmitted. So let's start off with this, uh, the first uh, thing I talked about, group B streptococcus. This is a, and the reason I'm going to put two uh, slides on this, is this is a very live debate in the UK at the moment. Group B streptococcus is a bug which many people carry uh, at any given time. It's very common. In the UK, it's carried by between 20 and 40% of women uh, of childbearing age around the birth canal. Normally does no harm. They don't know if they've got it. It's not causing any damage. 
If you look at the numbers, around uh, one in 1,750 babies develop early onset group B streptococcus themselves. Look at the ratios there. So the great majority of the women who are carrying this do not pass it on. But, and most babies who do have this infection early when they come out of the birth canal, make a full recovery with antibiotics with no long-term problems. But a small number, but an important number, may die, and a small but important number may have a disability. So the question is, uh, what should uh, we do about this? And this is a particularly high risk in uh, babies which are born preterm. And there's a, the debate is around, should we actually screen mothers who are about to have a baby and find out if they've got that bug, and if they have, treat it with antibiotics. And the reason this is controversial is because it will lead to a reduction in the number of people who have, have strept, group B streptococcus as a baby. It'll also lead to a massive uh, treatment of pregnant women otherwise well with antibiotics. So here are some of the numbers. Uh, Modelling in the UK suggests that uh, if you uh, gave antibiotics to uh, over 96,000 women a year, you would uh, prevent around three deaths and four cases of severe disability. Now, if you're the mother or father or relative of the baby who's in that small number, you would strongly say we should screen and treat. Others might say, I don't want to give an antibiotics. And what we would need to do is probably uh, give about over 24,000 uh, pregnant women antibiotics to prevent one death from this condition. So this is a difficult balancing act. And therefore, the world has split into two camps, a group of countries which actually do screen and give antibiotics to everybody. Everybody screens and gives antibiotics to particular uh, high-risk groups. And a group of countries, which includes the UK, Scandinavia, uh, New Zealand, who do not screen because they think the overtreatment with antibiotics causes more problems. Here's an example of a live public health debate. And the only way we're going to sort this one out is to do a trial where we actually randomise people to this and try to find out uh, what is going to happen. So that's an example of something transmitted from the mother directly to the baby. Then the second form of transmission uh, is where the blood uh, mixes. And the example I'm going to use is HIV. So HIV is a blood-to-blood -blood, uh, transmitted disease. It has other roots, obviously, which we'll come on to. And in the early HIV epidemic, uh, 15 to 45%, depending where you are, of children of women who are HIV positive developed HIV themselves from their mother. Huge numbers. This is not trivial. This is really large numbers. And remember, this, this is in, uh, in countries where very often up to 30% of women who went into labour were HIV positive. These are very, very big numbers of babies. 65% of the people who are infected were infected at birth and there's blood mixing. A few of them were infected before birth. Uh, some of them were infected subsequently in breastfeeding. In high income settings like the UK, the number of people who now get HIV uh, if their mother is HIV positive is less than 1%. In fact, well less than 1%. So this is a problem which has not completely gone away, but it has virtually completely gone away. And the, res the, re the reason that has happened is we are testing mothers for HIV before they're born, and if they're positive, they're being put on effective drugs, antiretrovirals, which suppress the virus, which then does not get transmitted. And we're now down to fractions of a percent who actually go on to get this problem, not yet quite zero. Globally, uh, it hasn't gone away completely, but it is a lot better than it was. So if you compare ourselves uh, to where we were uh, 10 years ago, uh, the rates have gone down from uh, over a quarter of a million down to uh, probably now less than 180,000, still significant numbers. And if you look at all the countries, and you won't be able to read this, this is Uganda, Namibia, South Africa down here, and at the top, Indonesia, Angola, and Ghana, what you find is there isn't a strong correlation between which are the poorest countries and which ones have got this sorted out. So Uganda, for example, has got a rate of HIV transmission from mothers which is almost as low as the UK, despite not being uh, one of the uh, richest countries in the world. So it is possible to do even in low-income settings with good organisation. So that takes us up to 72 hours. You will, we, I will speed up 
But this, this first period is really important. At 72 hours, the, the infections you're going to have a baby having problems with are going to change completely. And they move from the blood and the birth canal uh, infections to ones that come from the skin. Classical things that all of you will have in your skin, infections in particular, the bacteria Staphylococcus. Uh, and uh, these may, these, ha these tend to be particularly problematic in children who are premature and in particular ones who are in intensive care units, in part because we're sticking large numbers, as the medical profession, large numbers of lines and injections into them, which increases the risk of this happening. Breastfeeding is also very uh, protective. And in uh, high intensity units, these can actually be um, uh, very multi-drug resistant as well. So this is a serious problem at the 72 uh, uh, day, um, hour period. And then go a little bit further on to a week Historically, one of the greatest things, things that killed people uh, in their first month of life was tetanus. And in fact, in some countries, that was true until really quite recently. And this tends to occur into about a week into infection. Uh, and it's largely or completely preventable by maternal immunisation and good midwifery. And if you look around the world, uh, the, there has been a 95% reduction since the 1980s by a combination of vaccinating mothers and improving birth, birthing practices. So this used to be a major killer of babies under the age of a month. It is now uh, a relatively uh, minor one and in very, very specific number of countries, uh, which are the ones in red here. Now, over the next period, the mother protects her baby from infections, but the baby comes into a very high risk environment. Uh, newborns are very vulnerable to infections. And mother protects it by uh, three things. The first of which um, is quite a lot of antibodies will have been transmitted across the placenta to the baby when it was in the, in the, in the womb. So it comes into the world with the antibodies. Secondly, she transmits antibodies herself through breast milk, particularly in the first few uh, days, very thick kind of breast milk, uh, colostrum. And thirdly, uh, she protects the baby by uh, basic hygiene measures. Uh, and making sure that there is breastfeeding and uh, that the situation is clean. Those three are the absolutely critical things in this early period after the first few uh, um, days. So we then move into the period up between uh, the first few months, two months, and five years. And in this period, globally, infections still dominate infant and child mortality. And what you see is that uh, about 45% of deaths in children under the age of five occur in the neonatal period. Quite a lot of those are from infections. All the things I've starred here with a, 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 um, a pyramid are all infections. But also infections are a very major cause of mortality in the period uh, immediately after that. Uh, pneumonia, diarrhea, and malaria being three really important diseases which can cause this. So then you move into a different group of diseases. Uh, measles and HIV are in some cases important. But, and here's the really important but on that slide, this is the period also when our public health interventions, in particular sanitation, nutrition and vaccination, have their greatest impact. And because we have applied those and applied those at scale over the last 40 years, the rates of child deaths have absolutely plummeted. So on my left here is the number of deaths, the number of children under the age of five who died in the 1970s, 16 million. By the time we got down to 2016, we are uh, around five million, and that rate is continuing to go down. The great majority of this improvement is improvements of those three things, improving uh, nutrition, improving sanitation and, prove, and providing vaccination. And if we go through the, the body systems that we've talked about earlier in this series, uh, for the uh, respiratory causes, measles vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine, whooping cough vaccine and diphtheria are three vaccines, three absolutely critical things. For the diarrheal diseases, sanitation, clean water and uh, disposal of feces are critical, but also the rotavirus vaccine, and more recently, for, the new, for meningitis and the meningococcal and encephalitis things, for the brain infections we talked about in the first part of the year, meningococcus vaccine, haemophilus influenzae vaccine, mumps, 
uh, and pneumococcus. Uh, and if you put these together, the impact on mortality has been massive. And a lot of people say, well, vaccines work a bit. So let me just show a few of these really important infections, and you will not need uh, to have very good eyesight to work out where it is that the vaccine was introduced. Along the bottom axis is time, and the arrow is where we introduce the vaccine. On the left is pneumococcal vaccine. Then you have rotavirus vaccine for diarrhea. When I was training, the most important cause of meningitis uh, in children was this uh, infection called Haemophilus influenzae, Hib. This is where we int introduced the vaccine. Uh, the Hib just disappears. There are virtually no cases. And here in an earlier era is diphtheria. So vaccination has had an absolutely astonishing impact on child infections over the last few decades. And this builds on having got rid of very large numbers of infections in childhood over time. In the 19th century, cholera and typhoid, almost exclusively by improvements in sanitation uh, and uh, clean water. 20th century, uh, TB, rheumatic fever, polio, whooping cough and measles. Not gone, but the mortality rates from these massively reduced, largely because of better nutrition, less crowding, uh, as well as uh, medical interventions. And in the 21st century, uh, really getting to grips with the, the, the bacteria that causes a lot of the meningitis, uh, meningococcus. And these were very important infections. Here is an unfortunate child, she looks remarkably cheerful, uh, who had polio. She would have lived in that iron lung for the rest of her life. These are non-trivial infections. This is a huge improvement. So now we're, we've got past our fourth or fifth birthday, go to school. Uh, the, then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face creeping like snail unwillingly to school, or rather unlike these uh, folk on the right. By this stage, children are really much less likely to die of infections wherever they are in the world. Their, their immune system is improved. Uh, they are basically generally a lot more robust. But this is not to say that children uh, of school age don't get infections. They can get a few serious infections. But what they certainly get is anything that's going. Basically, schools are the most efficient vehicle for getting a bug from one person to another person uh, short of deliberately infecting them. It's just an astonishing uh, kind of crucible of infections. And therefore, uh, the immune system during your schooling years learns a huge amount, even if you do not. This is something where actually you come out of school having been exposed to a very large number of infections, uh, which you've usually passed on to your uh, delighted parents uh, along the way, just keeping their immune system frisky. Fris uh, and the next time you really come across bugs in this kind of number is when you either go to university or college, uh, so-called freshers flu, or first go to the world of work, where you're mixing with a completely different group of people. But this is uh, quite a, uh, quite a uh, way of getting things done. And I'm making that point for two reasons, partly to explain to parents why it is their children look so disgusting when they come home initially, uh, because they're doing an important job sharing, uh, sharing bugs, but also because for some epidemics, and the most common one for this is, a, is when we have serious flu epidemics, and particularly pandemics, one of the things you do if you want to slow the epi epidemic down is you close the schools because so much of the transmission occurs in schools that if you close the school, you won't stop the epidemic progressing, but you'll slow it right down, pull the peak right down, and buy yourself time to do things like get vaccines and get other uh, measures in place. I'm not going to go through these models. These are just to show that what we do whenever there's a big epidemic is we model what will be the impact of closing a school and for how long, and we then try and trade off how much education will the child lose how much will the parents get really annoyed? Uh, and how much can we slow down the epidemic? And we triangulate those three based on mathematics. Not, not too long after school, uh, we move on to the next phase of life, uh, the, ne the next uh, uh, one of uh, Shakespeare's things, then the lover sighing like furnace. Uh, it's a wonderful time, I'm told. Uh, um, but... <laughs> Uh, with this er er period of life come a whole bunch of infections which previously didn't stand a chance or stood an almost zero chance. Those are the sexually transmitted infections. There are quite a lot of infections that are basically just designed to be transmitted sexually because it's a very good way of getting one person close to another person uh, in a happy environment. And therefore they will occur, if they occur at all, after sexual debut and usually they occur relatively soon after sexual debut if they're going to happen. <laughs> 
Majority of them are just are common and not very important. In fact, most of them have almost no symptoms at all. You don't know you're getting them. You just do. They don't do any harm. A few are slightly nuisance, like genital warts. Some are unpleasant, but rarely dangerous, which include herpes simplex, which can initially cause uh, quite a lot of pain and discomfort, but usually uh, only once, uh, and gonorrhea, which I'll come back to. But there are a small number of these which are life-threatening. And people think of sexually transmitted infections as something just a bit embarrassing. Actually, they are considerably more than that. And uh, three important ones, HIV, uh, syphilis, uh, and the cancer-causing papillomavirus. So just uh, two of those I want to talk a bit about. Uh, the first is HIV. Between uh, the 80, uh, 19, uh, 1980 and uh, 2010, uh, HIV uh, was one of the most important new threats to health we have actually faced, uh, certainly in our lifetimes. 35 million people di died to date, more will die. This is a really serious uh, pandemic. Uh, it affected children, uh, it affected uh, gay men, uh, and this is from a fantastic book for anybody who's not, uh, who would like to see what it was like to be working, as I did actually work in this ward, what it was like to be working as an infectious disease doctor or, importantly, working with uh, uh, young men in this era. Uh, all of them died, 100% mortality. And the deaths kept on climbing up to about 2005, and this red area is people aged 15 to 49. This is, the, this is basically the age group who caught this disease. Now I'm glad to say the deaths are falling really quite rapidly. Transmission's falling slower, but the actual uh, chance of dying from this, if you are properly treated, as we'll come on to, is very, very different. So if we take a high-income country like the UK, <coughs> the incidence is now dropping. I'll come back to that. But the more important thing is actually in many ways is that HIV is now a disease you can live with perfectly normally. Someone with HIV disease, which was 100% fatal when I was training and as junior doctor, will now live the same length probably as anybody else. The drugs are much less dangerous than they were. The side effects are much less bad, so most of them are more of a nuisance than anything else. And importantly, and this, tri this study came out only last week, like to keep you up to the minute here in Gresham College. Um, we now know that both male female and female, so male female and male male relationships, if one person's got HIV and they're on treatment and the virus is suppressed with that treatment, there is zero chance of passing on the virus. So people can live a completely normal social, romantic family life, even if they got the disease on top of the fact that actually they will have a normal lifespan. This is a complete transformation. And because they don't transmit uh, so much, uh, the incidence is dropping to some degree, but slowly. It's still a big problem. Uh, it's around the world, it's everywhere, but it is very highly concentrated. Uh, on the left here is a map of where the really high rates of HIV still are in the world, and the dark colours are in areas where the prevalence in people, the number of people, the percentage of people who've got it, uh, who are, are young adults, uh, is greater than 25%. So this is a common disease in these, a very common disease. But on the right here is a very encouraging map in many ways. All the, uh, the countries which are in blue or dark green, the, the rates of HIV have dropped by more than 10%. So HIV is dropping virtually everywhere except for a particular area of southern Africa where, unfortunately, in some areas it's even going up, very highly concentrated. HIV is not the only disease that can do this um, sexually. Uh, when syphilis first arrived in the UK, uh, in, in the UK um, a couple of years after it arrived in Europe, it first, the first big outbreak in Europe was in Naples, Siege of Naples, uh, 1495. Um, it was actually a much more dangerous disease than it, it is now, even without, even, uh, with tr without treatment. Uh, frequently fatal. Uh, it went on to spread very rapidly through the population of Europe. Uh, a lot of debate about did it come from Latin America with Columbus, maybe. Um, and it caused huge numbers of other problems. Dementia, mental illness, stroke, heart attack, bone disease, skin disease. The range of diseases that syphilis caused was absolutely massive. Again, not a trivial disease. Uh, if we went back uh, 100 years, uh, in the city of London, we know that roughly 10% of the adult male population had it. 
There was a Royal Commission that established this. Uh, and so just think about that as you look around afterwards. Um, what collapsed this epidemic was penicillin. The arrival of penicillin meant that lots of people who had syphilis were treated del deliberately and large numbers of people who didn't realise they had syphilis were given antibiotics for other reasons and it got rid of it. So the arrival of antibiotics was really the death knell of this. And of course the thing which that means for all of us, uh, although there is a little bit of syphilis still, its risk is very low now and the risk of dying from it are practically zero, uh, we do worry about uh, drug resistance because here's an example of a disease, and HIV is another, where we rely on treatment drugs. This is not vaccines, this is not sanitation, this is basically treatment. And one of the most multi-drug uh, infections in the world at the moment is another sexually transmitted infection, gonorrhea, gonococcus. Much less serious than HIV, um, unpleasant, I'm told it's like peeing razor, razor blades. Um, it's dangerous in certain circumstances, particularly around childbirth. So rather like the streptococcus B at the beginning, if the mother's got it, she can pass it on to her baby, that's dangerous, but that's very rare. But we have a serious problem in the UK with multi-drug resistance gonorrhea. And for those of us in London, uh, the map here, red is bad. There's a lot of gonococcus about. So gonococcus is very common in urban areas and London and the big urban centres of the rest of England are there, and now quite a lot of it is resistant to virtually every antibiotic that we know. And we're going to have to develop new antibiotics to get on top of this. Now, clearly, sexually transmitted infections are not the main thing which uh, sexual activity is for. Uh, its primary aim, biologically, is pregnancy. And therefore, pregnancy uh, is an important area, and this is where I start to diverge from... Uh, Mr. Shakespeare, because he doesn't uh, include women in his uh, thing, and his versions of work, which I'll come on to, are rather different to ours. Um, in f being pregnant is a dangerous state for a very large number of reasons, but infections are amongst them. And there's also the risk of transmission of infections from the mother to the baby before birth, because I started on your birthday. So after birth, there's a serious risk of sepsis, infection, a few infections are very specific to pregnant women. They happen almost entirely in pregnant women. But much more importantly, there can be a number of infections which are more severe in pregnancy or which can be trivial to the mother but cross the placenta and cause problems to the baby. Let's start off with infections specific to pregnancy. Around 10% of maternal deaths uh, globally are due to infection. So it's still a really major cause of mothers dying in pregnancy. And the most important of those is something which in old-fashioned terminology used to be called purpural sepsis. Still is, actually, by many doctors. And what that basically just means is bacterial infections soon after birth. They get a sepsis, which was caused by having a child, uh, a, a child. And in fact, the great majority of this was caused by doctors. Still is, and midwives. So there was a period when it was very common for doctors to deliver a baby. If it was born, still born, they'd go off and dissect it. Then they'd go back and deliver the next baby. They wouldn't wash their hands. And the result of that was disastrous. And the person who demonstrated this was this gentleman here, uh, Ignaz Simmelweis, a Hungarian uh, physician. And he demonstrated that if you just got doctors to clean their hands with chlorine, the, seps the purple sepsis rates disappeared. So this is not a problem from the mother to herself. This is a problem entirely inflicted by the medical and nursing professions uh, to mothers. Not absolutely every case now, but it was historically. Completely disappeared. Uh, he wasn't a popular guy for saying this at all. Washing your hands was apparently unpopular. Uh, he suffered enormous uh, pressure from the medical profession, uh, had a nervous breakdown. Other doctors uh, committed him to an asylum, and he died two weeks uh, after being committed there of sepsis, which he acquired being uh, forcibly restrained. So not a happy story, unfortunately, but he is actually one of the great uh, pioneers of, uh, of improving uh, rates of infection. But several other infections are severe, of course, in pregnancy. Uh, and that means that you have a situation where a disease which, if a mother, or if a woman was not pregnant, it would be relatively trivial. But in pregnancy, it can be much more severe, so they're more severe. And then there are some other diseases which the mother may not have a more severe infection, but she's much more likely to catch it when she's pregnant than when she's not pregnant. So I'll give some examples of both of those. More severe include influenza. Influenza. 
which is the reason why pregnant women are encouraged to get themselves, rather more than encouraged, I hope, to get themselves vaccinated in pregnancy. And just to give some examples, during the 1918 flu pandemic, when the overall mortality for uh, uh, men and women was um, around about 5%, the mortality in pregnant women was 27%. Uh, if you look back to the 1957 flu pandemic, 50% of the deaths in reproductive age women occurred when they were pregnant. So flu and pregnancy, bad combination. Another infection I talked about last uh, time round, hepatitis E, around 1% mortality in, uh, under ordinary circumstances, but if you are pregnant, there is a 20% mortality. So a mother who is pregnant if for these specific infections is much more likely to die than if she was not pregnant, uh, but otherwise. And there are other infections that are similar, like herpes and malaria. And pregnancy, as I say, also makes women more susceptible. So the reason that we, get, uh, we try and encourage women who are pregnant not to eat unpasteurised cheese is because they're much more likely, for example, to catch the bacterial infection listeria which normally would be a pretty rare thing to catch. HIV, malaria are, are also in this group. Alongside the baby, the mother has an organ uh, which she doesn't have at any other stage of her life, and that's the placenta. And the placenta in infection has two important roles, or two important uh, fun uh, features. The first is there are some infections, and the most important of these is malaria, which specifically lock onto the placenta as part of its survival strategy. So malaria has a particular kind of binding thing, a ligand, who only works when a woman is pregnant with a placenta. That's the only place it works. But actually more importantly are the fact that actually the placenta is a very, very good way of protecting the baby from an infection which the mother might catch. And that's very important because an infection may be trivial to mum, but actually very severe to baby. So having this barrier is biologically really important. But there are unfortunately a few infections which are capable of being transmitted between the mother and the baby through the placenta, or across the placenta rather, uh, and uh, they can be trivial in the mother, but they can be really severe, severe. And I think the one that most people here, or two that most people will be aware of, the first of which is rubella, German measles. And it's usually a trivial infection, uh, rash, fever, you don't feel great for a few days, that's about it. But if you actually are pregnant and it gets passed on to the baby, then the baby will go on to have really serious problems, including of vision, losing eyes, uh, losing, uh, losing visual capacity, hearing, uh, and significant congenital abnormalities. But there's another important point about rubella. If you are someone who, um, uh, in the pre-vaccination era, the chance of you catching rubella as a child was incredibly high, very, very common infection. And therefore, by the time you got to be of pregnancy age, childbearing age, you were immune to rubella because you only catch it once in your life. But what happens if you vaccinate half the population, but not the other half? And the result is the average age of infection goes up. And unfortunately, there have been some situations, the most famous of which happened, uh, infamous of which happened in Greece, where we had a partial vaccination program for rubella. And the result was the average age of infection went up and therefore more babies were born with rubella syndrome than if there'd been no vaccination at all. The point with this is once you've got a vaccination program with rubella, you've got to try and go for absolutely as high a coverage as you possibly can partial vaccination program is actually very potentially very dangerous. Other important infections that can cross the placenta, chickenpox, something called cytomegalovirus and toxoplasmosis. I'm not going to go through them in detail. But new infections emer are emerging the whole time. And in the very first talk of this series, I talked about emerging infections and epidemics. And the one which everybody will be aware of because it hit the press in a big way here uh, was Zika. Uh, and this is the graph of the number of cases uh, of uh, suspected uh, Zika. And what happened as a result was babies were born with significant neurological damage. And we're going to be living with a cohort of babies who were seriously damaged by this uh, for a time. This is a mosquito-borne disease, not a risk here in the UK because we don't have the mosquitoes to transmit it. But it is still spreading around the world. It's not going up at this point, but this infection has not gone away. So there are serious risks to this in anywhere where this, uh, in fact, this mosquito, uh, Aedes aegypti, uh, lives. 
So that's pregnancy. How about the world of work? If we'd been doing this talk early, uh, early in the last century, I'd have given half of the talk, probably, about what infections can you catch from work. Modern work is much less dangerous, at least from the point of view of infections. But different work environments expose you to different sorts of infection. So, um, for example, uh, lung infections of the f with fungi, with uh, yeasts and fungi, are very common in people who work with crops because the uh, fungi in the, uh, are in the crops when you harvest them, uh, when you do all, you thresh them and so on, uh, you get exposed to them. Animal husbandry, I'll come on to this in a bit more detail, can expose people to animal diseases which can also infect humans, what's called zoonoses. Industrial work can damage the body's defences against infection, of which the most important is the lung, and healthcare workers are at very significantly increased risk of quite a lot of infections. So just take a few examples uh, of each of those. Start off with um, uh, the uh, infections from uh, agricultural work. Start off with the, the infection brucellosis. Brucellosis is named after this uh, rather formidable gent, uh, Major General Sir David Bruce, um, a British uh, military physician, um, one of the, great, the greats of uh, infectious diseases. And he was sent out to work out why people were getting a high fever in Malta uh, this is uh, a photograph from where he uh, was doing it. And this isn't just a holiday snap. This is the reason. The infection, brucellosis, was passed from goats and sheep to uh, farmers, mainly in milking, passed on to the dairymen and women, mainly in the dairy process, passed on to vets when they looked after sick animals, and passed on to end consumers when they ate unpasteurised yoghurt or drank unpasteurised milk. So there were lots of ways you can get it all the way along the system. Gone from the UK, although there are occasional risks uh, to the UK, you can still get it in, in, in uh, a variety of things. Uh, so we don't have very many camels, for example, but we do have a lot of cattle, goats, sheep and pigs. So several infections that it could go into still come in the Middle East uh, and you can still catch it if you eat uh, lovely labne that hasn't been pasteurised in the Middle East. People do still occasionally catch it. So that's an animal-associated disease with an agricultural-associated disease. How about industrial work? So here is uh, um, TB and pneumonia in miners. Miners uh, have an incredibly difficult job. It's very dangerous for multiple reasons, but one of the reasons it's dangerous is it damages the lungs, and it's the silica dust that does most of the damage, and this makes people much more susceptible to TB and pneumonia. And almost all forms of mining lead to this increased risk. So not just coal mining, which we've got here, but also gold mining, copper mining, uh, any kind of mining around the world, particularly deep mining, uh, also open cast if people are not, more ca are not careful about it. But the group who are probably the greatest risk of catching infections are healthcare workers. Uh, and within those, I have to say, one of the greatest risks is infectious disease uh, doctors, which is what I am. Uh, so here is uh, an example, uh, Ebola, and I could have given multiple other examples, but Ebola is a good recent one. Here's what happened when the first case of Ebola were flew into Nigeria. Each of the people this, that were infected in the mini outbreak that followed are on this uh, graph here. All the ones in blue are healthcare workers. All the ones circled in red died. And the same would be true if we were talking about SARS or MERS or any other new emerging infections, particularly respiratory infections or infections that are invo involved in touch or infections passed on by blood. So, and Ebola uh, was a touch disease. SARS and MERS were infectious things. One of the ways you tell an, an epidemic is happening is doctors and nurses start to die. They are, in, in epidemiological terms, the canary in the, uh, the mine. Now, just a few of the odd infections, which at different stages of life produce very different diseases. And I'll go through these relatively quickly, but just to show that something which can be trivial at one age can cause serious problems later on. And the examples I want to use are ones where an adult gets what we normally think of as a child disease. And we are, in a sense, uh, genetically born to try and not die of the child disease but because adult diseases don't often get them, adults maybe actually get the disease more severely. The examples I'm going to use are chickenpox, 
mumps, hepatitis A, and uh, something called Epstein-Barr virus. Start off with chickenpox. In children, an unpleasant disease, you know, no one wants, wants to have, it, have a child with chickenpox, um, they're very miserable, but uh, rarely serious. But in adults, they can get really serious complications, and I'll give uh, just uh, two examples. One example is they can get a very bad pneumonia, and essentially they get chickenpox of the lung, and for the rest of their lives, what you'll see is the scarring in the lung. These are the scars here of the chickenpox, and people can die of this, chickenpox pneumonia. Don't get it as a kid, only as an adult. And uh, adults are definitely at higher risk of dying of chickenpox. Um, pregnant women, immunosuppressed adults are at greatest risk of this. Pregnancy, again, uh, uh, a worry. The same virus can present in a different way in adulthood. This is uh, shingles. And shingles are very unpleasant infection, not life-threatening, but certainly life-unenhancing, uh, which people get more severely as they go on through age. Bait children very, very rarely get this. Another childhood disease, mumps. Generally mild in children, although it can cause uh, an encephalitis, which is a men and uh, a meningitis, for, and for that reason we have it in vaccination schedules. But once you go through puberty, the, in fact, the problems can be quite severe, particularly for men. So men can get a really bad inflammation of the testes, and in some cases this can lead to subfertility or what used to be called infertility. They can't have children uh, as a result. Uh, we've known this since Hippocrates in 400 BC. Women get uh, less severe problems, and it doesn't seem to affect fertility in the same way. Hepatitis A, a very trivial infection if you get it as a child. The great majority of children uh, in low-income settings get it. The great majority of children who get it have absolutely no symptoms at all. Maybe 10% have jaundice. But if you get it in adulthood, and many people from the UK may get it in adulthood because they travel to places where this is very common, and they're not vaccinated. If you're vaccinated, no risk. But if you're not vaccinated, uh, you can get this very common infection. 70% will get jaundice. A few will get fulminant liver failure, and a few of those will die. So, you know, very trivial infection in childhood, serious infection in adulthood. Uh, and finally, in this group, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, also known as glandular fever, infectious mononucleosis, and the kissing disease. Uh, Absolutely trivial infection in childhood. If you get it in school, you'll hardly notice it. A few snuffles and off you go. But those who encounter it first as an adult can get this really quite unpleasant infection with high fevers, glands coming up everywhere uh, in very uh, significant numbers of those. And the fatigue can be very prolonged. This is one of the classic freshers flu infections. And for some people, they can be fatigued for months afterwards, in a few unfortunate cases, even a year. Final point, which in a sense is small print, except when it's not, is that when a new epidemic occurs, it can often behave differently from the traditional infections. And the illustration I'm going to use of this uh, is flu. This curve here is the curve of mortality for influenza in the years 1911 to 2000 and, so 1917. And as you can see, this is age along the bottom. Almost all the mortality is in children under the age of four, and in adults over the age of 65. But in the pandemic, there was a significant spike of mortality in young adults. So epidemics can behave rather differently uh, to the infection under ordinary circumstances. Uh, and the same is true with the parasitic infection, uh, malaria. Uh, but the main point I want to make malaria is the parasite malaria in the human, homo, homo sapiens, at different ages causes completely different diseases. If a child under the age of one catches malaria, severe malaria, if they die, they're likely to die of anemia, not enough blood. If they die when they're a young child, anemia is still a problem, but the very big problem you tend to get uh, is problems with the lung, respiratory distress, and a little bit of what's called cerebral malaria, malaria in the brain. If they get it age above five, lung problems increase, uh, but you also get an increasing amount of cerebral malaria. And by the time the, the lung, in this case, is caused by acid rather than the lung itself, by the time you get to adults, a third of people are, who are untreated die of kidney disease, which doesn't happen in children, hardly at all. A third die of cerebral malaria, which, but by a different mechanism for children. And a third uh, die of respiratory uh, uh, distress, which is not caused by acidosis, but it's caused by damage to the lung itself. So different ages, same parasite, same human, 
different diseases. And these diseases, which in low-income settings um, can kill people in very large numbers, the reason for that may be just to do with poverty. And I'm, this is my final point before I move on to older age. Malaria is an infection which kills huge numbers of people still in the world, over 400,000 people in the world, almost all of them children. So you might take from that that malaria is more dangerous to children, but that's not true. Because if we look at all the malaria imported into the UK, where people of all ages are imported, we basically do not see any child deaths at all. Children come in, they can get severe malaria, they don't die in a high income setting with good care. The age distribution for malaria in terms of mortality is exactly the same as for every other infection. So what is killing poor children in poorer countries is the fact they're poor, not the fact they're children. And this has led to a situation uh, where, uh, because we know what to do with children, we've got these huge uh, improvements in child mortality. And if we look over the next uh, 30 years, child mortality globally is going to fall even further than it has at the moment, and in my view, even faster. And we look to an era where outside countries absolutely are in conflict, infections will become a trivial issue for anyone under the age of 65, except with some very unlucky uh, uh, individuals and people who are pregnant. Where things are going in the opposite direction, however, uh, is in terms of mortality from infections in older people. And this again, just going back to this at the beginning, this uh, is the distribution of mortality uh, in the UK. So huge chance of dying, this is age standardised. These are people aged 85 or above, 80 and so on. Trivial numbers down here. And the number of people who die from infections is probably greater than these numbers imply because there are direct causes of death from infection and increasingly what we're understanding over the last few years is there's a very large number of people who die indirectly because of infections. And this is important because if you think about the age distribution in the UK, two things are happening. First of which is we're getting older. Well, you know that, but just to put the numbers starkly, around 3,000 people over age 80 now, there will be around 7,000 people over 80 in uh, 2048. So this uh, is going to over double over the next period. And these are very susceptible to infections. And the geography is also changing because these uh, folk are primarily moving within the UK out of urban areas, uh, stereotyped parts of uh, the UK, uh, North Norfolk, for example, Devon coast, uh, the Lancashire areas. So we're going to see a shift of infection from the areas where there have been children to deaths in the urban areas historically uh, to these uh, rural areas. And I'm just going to rattle through these. These are just to remind you, for those who come to all the, uh, the talks, uh, the, that for every single one of the organ systems I've talked about, people who are older are at much greater risk. So here, for example, are urinary tract infections, the biggest cause of infections in the elderly. Uh, and for those, uh, and if you look at the age bands, uh, what you see is much higher rates in those who are uh, 85 or above, and you're more likely to get an infection. And if you get an infection, you're more likely to get a sepsis. And if you get a sepsis, you're more likely to die. For each of these things, things are worse uh, if you're an older person. Here's pneumonia, the second most important. Uh, this is the rate per 100,000 100, people. If you're over 80, it's up at this rate. It's quite a big drop down to those 70 to 80, this line here. And then children under the age of five and those between 60 and 70 are kind of running a joint race together. Everyone else is much lower. So much higher risks of having pneumonia uh, if, you have, uh, if you're older. And we can do things about uh, pneumonia. As you know, in children, we do major infection improvements with vaccination. In children, we've taken it down from a very low number to a much lower number. We've almost halved it. In adults, we're taking it down from an incredible, in very old adults, we're taking it down from an incredibly high number to a still very high number. It's an improvement, but you're still left with a very large number of people who've got uh, the risk of infection over time. And it's not just deaths. This disease, shingles, which I talked about, steadily increases over time uh, as you grow older. 
and also the risk of having complications from this increases. So the burden of infection risk is steadily going to swing towards those diseases which are more common in older people, particularly the ones I'm talking about. Now, the good news on this is we are making progress in some areas. And shingles is a good example of this, actually. We currently have a vaccine uh, that reduces the risk of shingles by about 50%. If you go to the GP, your GP today and, and get one, that's what you get. Strongly encourage you to do it. There is, because it's a very unpleasant infection. However, there's an infect, a, a shingles vaccine, vaccine which has come out in the last year, which reduces your risk of shingles by 90% and seems to last for a lot longer. The reason that's important is, firstly, it's a nasty disease, but secondly, it's demonstrating that even in people in their late 80s, the immune system is perfectly capable of mounting an immune response if we can actually get it right. We've been very good at improving the immunity of children. We now need to go on to do exactly the same thing in much older adults where a lot of the burden is going to happen. And that is really, in my view, a science that is only really still in its infancy. But there's also this uh, important phenomenon that infections cause other diseases, in particular cardiovascular diseases. And I'll just use two examples. Here uh, is another uh, study from earlier this, uh, this year uh, in the England Journal. Uh, and this showed that if you have a pneumonia, pneumococcal pneumonia, very common pneumonia, your risk of heart attack is massively greater immediately after that and that this risk continues out for many weeks, and in the case of a severe infection, out to maybe two years. Having an infection significantly increases your risk of having a heart attack. And this has been found repeatedly in infections. Here's another study basically looking at the same thing. But this compares various infections uh, and, uh, with both stroke and heart disease. And what it shows is that if you have um, a very bad uh, infection, your risk, your odds ratio of having uh, a, a, a heart attack uh, is almost 10, tenfold greater than if you don't have an infection. If you have a mild infection, uh, it's still significantly increased, but the more severe the infection, the greater the risk of a heart attack. And the same is true to a lesser extent of stroke. So I think what we're now realizing, which we really hadn't before, is that quite a bit of the uh, heart attack and stroke, which is a major part of mortality and morbidity, long-term problems in the UK, are actually driven by infections. Dealing with infections may well be one of the ways we can help get the cardiovascular improvements, which have stalled a bit at the moment, uh, back on track, in my view. And then uh, there are, uh, finally, uh, two uh, things which are uh, very concerning, one of which is short-lived but may have longer-term implications, and the other is uh, I think we still don't quite know what to do about it. The first is the, the, uh, the uh, condition delirium. Now, delirium, for those who have seen it, and many of you may have seen it in elderly relatives of yours or elderly friends of yours, is very, very frightening indeed. Someone who is actually completely normal, has a normal life, plays sports, sees their friends, reads completely no goes into hospital, has a relatively trivial infection, and then their personality shifts completely. They go essentially loopy for a re relatively short period of time usually, but their, their whole personality changes. They can become aggressive. Uh, they, can become, uh, they can have uh, real difficulties, drowsy, uh, confused, uh, and not recognize their closest relatives. Then it gets better again. But we worry about this. Is this something which could be a risk for late, later dementia and later brain uh, issues? We don't know, but we worry about that. It certainly is something uh, which is very frightening to see. But the real question, I think, which we do not have an answer to, and I think is an important one, is are infections causal or contributory to people getting dementia? Because dementia is steadily increasing as a, both a proportion and absolute number here in the UK and all high-income countries. We certainly know that historically, several infections have been able to cause particular dementias. Important ones uh, historically were syphilis, which caused a very substantial proportion of dementia. If you'd gone back 100 years ago, uh, a large number of the people who had dementia, it would have been caused by syphilis. It's a really serious cause. Now gone. We know that HIV causes dementia because of good treatment. Now gone, but it used to be a very serious problem if people weren't on treatment. 
We're really left with three talk types of dementia. And for those who are interested, I've done a whole talk on dementia. It's on, on the uh, Gresham College uh, YouTube tube channel. But uh, the three important ones, Alzheimer's disease, which everyone's heard of, something called dementia with Lewy bodies, and vascular dementia. With all of these, we do not know whether an infection can cause uh, dementia or not. But there are several infections which are associated with dementia, of which two important ones are some herpes and viruses and something called P. gingivalis. It's a mouth bacteria. In my view, it would be fantastic if there is an infection link to dementia, not in every case, but in some cases, because infections are something we have historically proved very, very good at treating or preventing. So my summary... As we go through our lives, <coughs> infections change enormously. The, the infections you get change over time. How dangerous they are change over time. Uh, the pattern of disease with an infection changes over time. And over the long term, we're moving from infections in childhood being a huge driver of mortality to a situation where infections in older adults are going to be the big burden. And in my view, science has really not started yet to get to grips with that. Thank you very much.